Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. I'm from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. So our goal is to um, do public outreach about ticks and mosquitoes. Um, I have some background with both, so I'm happy to talk about it. So we're going to be going over the biology, ecology, prevention, and management of ticks and mosquitoes today. Oops. Perfect. So a little bit about our lab. So we're a diagnostic and research lab here at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. What we do is we take in client samples from any Maine resident. Uh, those samples are typically ticks found off themselves or off their pets. Um, and we test those ticks for a variety of pathogens. So the types of pathogens that we test for are, say, like Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, Poisson virus, and the list goes on. Um, we test a variety of different species of ticks. So we test dog ticks, black-legged ticks. Um, occasionally we'll get in Lone Star ticks or Gulf Coast ticks. Um, but primarily we see a lot of uh, dog ticks or the black-legged or deer ticks is what they're also commonly known as. Um, what that client receives is they receive a report of the tick, um, typically an image, and they also receive the life stage of the tick, the um, engorgement status, and the sex of the tick, if it's a male or a female. Um, and then it also says um, if that tick has any pathogens or not. So it's a really great service that we have here at the Diagnostic and Research Laboratory. Um, and that's what I work for. So it's pretty cool, pretty exciting. So now we're gonna kind of go over the biology of ticks and mosquitoes. So sort of how I have this PowerPoint set up is that there's different categories and within each of the categories, I'll be talking about both mosquitoes and ticks. So a bit about ticks, so a bit about their behavior. So as you know, that they're attracted to CO2, so what we breathe. Um, they're also attracted to heat and movement. So say if an animal is in the woods um, walking around, that tick is uh, actively trying to seek out that animal um, by questing. And again, we're going to go over a little bit more about the behavior in a bit, um, but it, that's how they um, are attracted to animals. Um, they do not fly or jump, so ticks are pretty slow for the most part. There are some species, like the Lone Star tick, um, is a bit faster, um, but typically they'll just quest. Um, they're very kind of slow-moving um, ticks, and then they have four life stages, so you have the egg, larvae, nymph, and adult tick, um, and again, we'll sort of go over the life stage in a little bit with the diagram, but they do have four life stages. Um, they take a blood meal once per life stage. So what happens is the tick will attach themselves to an animal. Um, that tick then feeds on that animal for an extended period of time and the tick falls off. Um, and then it molts into the next uh, stage of the tick um, or it lays eggs. So it really depends on what life stage it's at. So it only takes one meal, blood meal per life stage. Um, they can also go without feeding for several months, so they really don't need to feed very often um, to survive, which is also really interesting. And they may increase their body weight to 200 to 600 times their, their normal uh, body. So after a blood meal, you can see them pretty engorged in the picture here. Um, they're about the size of a penny, so typically they're pretty small, um, but it's pretty uh, interesting how they can actually really um, become a lot larger based on their engorgement. So a bit about mosquito behavior. So again, they're also attracted to CO2 heat and body odor, very similar to ticks. Um, only the female mosquitoes bite, so the male mosquitoes do not. Male mosquitoes prefer to have flower nectar, so they're a bit more on pollinators than they are. They don't take any blood meal like the female mosquitoes do. Female mosquitoes also have four life stages, but they have an egg, larvae, pupae, and adult. And again, we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, they take multiple meals, blood meals during their life stage. So unlike the tick that only needs one blood meal per life stage, a mosquito will take multiple. So they'll feed on multiple different animals at any point. Um, and then the female mosquito can live for over six months without feeding. So a tick can live longer, um, but female mosquitoes can also live for a pretty long time without feeding. Koyuma? Okay, I just saw the question, sorry. 
Um, so for tick feeding, so ticks have this hypostome here. So you can see it's pretty serrated. So what happens is the tick will actually excrete a saliva that's sort of like a numbing agent. So what happens is the tick will actually attach themselves to an animal or even a person. Um, they secrete the saliva in order to um, penetrate the skin with their hypostone. And again, it's barbed to sort of the opposite way. So that way they really attach to a host. Um, and they can stay on that host for, uh, it really depends on the tick species themselves. Sometimes it could take um, a few hours to a few days. So it depends on the tick species and how long they stay on the host in order to require that blood meal. Um, but you can see it's here, the, their mouth parts, that hypostome, really interesting. Oops. And again, this is some more images of a tick once it's in someone. Um, you can just sort of see the mouth parts are sort of engorged uh, right in the skin. So a little bit graphic, but that's that. Uh, mosquito feeding. So a little bit similar in terms of the saliva. Um, and actually what happens with the saliva of a mosquito, it actually has more of a reaction to our skin. So some people have a pretty severe reaction and I think it's pretty normal to have that little itchy bump. Um, it's the saliva from the mosquito penetrating into our skin um, that makes it so our antibodies attack it and it sort of flares up and becomes that little red bump that's very itchy to us. So um, that's what happens anytime a mosquito tries to bite us. Um, and same thing, they'll take a blood meal several times um, in order to survive, they'll They'll digest that blood meal and lay eggs and things like that, similar to, to ticks, but fun fact about the itchy skin. So with ticks, so ticks have a two-year life cycle. Uh, so you can see that in the springtime, um, they the female tick will lay their eggs. Again, they'll molt into larvae. And then over time, it takes about a year for them to molt into a nymphal tick. And so at that point, once they are a nymphal tick, they'll take a blood meal on some larger animals. And I forgot to mention too, larvae tick will also take blood meals. So they typically will take their blood meal on some smaller animals, so some mice, shrews, um, small rodents, things like that. And we'll kind of go over a little bit more on um, hosts of what ticks prefer to feed on. Um, once they're more of a nymphal tick, again, they will still start to sort of quest and look for somewhat larger hosts. But again, they're sort of generalists where they'll actually feed on mice, they'll feed on, you know, deer, humans, um, kind of whoever comes by. And then once they molt into an adult tick, that adult tick again will feed on typically larger animals. Um, and once they get that full blood meal, they'll lay eggs and then continue on the cycle. Um, so that's the blood meal. That's the tick life cycle in a nutshell. And then again, this is mostly for black legged ticks. Um, certain other ticks might have a slightly varied life cycle, but they all still need that blood meal. So now with the mosquito life cycle, um, a little bit similar in terms of the blood meal. So what happens is the female mosquito will take a blood meal and digest it and then uh, soon produce eggs and lay their eggs. Uh, Mosquitoes are actually more aquatic, so they're, most of their life stages do produce are in the water, um, while the female mosquitoes is, you know, a winged insect. Um, and so what happens is the female mosquito will lay its eggs, become, uh, they'll hatch into larvae, and larvae will kind of feed on little detritus, things like that in the water. Uh, mosquitoes typically like more um dirty mucky water i would say because they like that extra nutrients in there for the for the young immature larvae they'll then molt into a pupae and then shortly after that pupae will then molt into an adult mosquito um and again continue the life cycle on so and an interesting thing too with the eggs of the mosquito they form this little egg raft so it actually just floats on the top of the water so if you ever see yourself or if you have a bucket of water in your backyard that's been exposed for a period of time you might see little egg rafts on there but the water hasn't been treated or anything that they typically are these little black egg rafts um and then they soon hatch into little larvae which are pretty small and they do grow over time they have different uh instars and so an instar basically means that little larvae will molt into bigger larvae um, 
until they they become that pupae and then adult. So interesting. All right. So that was a bit of the biology and a biology of ticks and mosquitoes. Now we're going to kind of move into the ecology of both ticks and mosquitoes. So ticks in winter. So ticks can survive in the winter. Um, typically, they'll be pretty active even above freezing. Um, so if you're hiking or if you're out in the woods and it's a pretty warm day, you may see ticks. Um, even though they there might not be as many, they're still out and questing and active looking for those hosts. So just keep in mind, if it's a warm winter day and you want to go for a hike, just be aware you might come across a tick or two. So interesting fact. Um, habitat. So in terms of tick habitat, um, they typically are found in on the lower ground, so in any sort of low shrubs, um, low grasses, uh, or even tall grasses, things like that. So you wouldn't really find them like in the trees or anything. Um, they really like the vegetation floor or those tall grasses that they're able to climb up at. Um, so they're typically fine on the ground. Uh, typically in forested areas um, around leaf litter and things like that. Um, they do like the areas between lawn and field. So if you have an area that's relatively mowed and then you have the forest right on the bordering edge, you'll probably see a lot of them right on that edge there. Um, they, again, like tall grasses. So they like to be able to quest on those tall grasses. Um, they do like the leaf litter and around stone walls and wood piles are another big hot spot for ticks. So if you have a stone wall, other side of the stone wall is a little more shrubby or more woodsy, you'll probably find quite a few ticks in that area. And then in terms of mosquito habitat, um, they too typically like stagnant pools. So like I mentioned, they like more of the mucky um water because it's higher in nutrients for the larvae so the mosquitoes are more attracted to that mucky dirty water they like anything that's open containers so if you have a bucket in your backyard or a watering pan that was still full um they really like anything so even small large containers it really doesn't matter um they're not very picky so <laughs> anything with water um they really are attracted to anything even like tires so if you have a tire tires in your backyard and those are full of water um mosquitoes really like that and actually how a certain mosquito called 80s albopictus which you may have heard of they're a big transmitter of triple e and dengue and all sorts of fun nasty pathogens um they were actually imported from tires so what happened was tires were shipped overseas and the mosquitoes were able to survive in whatever little water the tires were in. And now we have these invasive mosquitoes, the Aedes albopictus. And, in, you know, it happens with a lot of different um, insects um, that we get in. So something with like bromeliads, they also like those. Um, there are certain species that um, breed and, and survive in the bromeliad. So those are the little plants that hold water. Um, they also like some mosquitoes like tree hole cavities. So if you have a very wooded area and you have, say, tree holes that pool with water, so there's some mosquitoes that really like that too. Um, and again, certain species prefer different types of habitat. So um, there's some species that prefer more urbanized habitat. Um, other species prefer more wooded habitat. So it really depends on the species. And unfortunately, the ones that really like the urban habitat to pen, tend to have a lot of uh, pathogens associated with that too. So um, we can get more on that in another time. <laughs> I see a question here. Oh no, okay, no question. All right, so tick questing. So I briefly mentioned that a little bit earlier. So how ticks like to um, find hosts is they have their little arms up and what happens is when a host or a deer or a person walks by, that little tick will cling right onto them and then scurry up their leg or whatever spot they want to take their blood meal in. Um, and we'll kind of go over that too a little bit later of like spots that ticks really like to be found, I guess, on a person um, from data that we have here in the lab. So that's sort of how these ticks, like the dog tick and the black-legged tick, they quest. Um, ticks like 
Lone Star Tick, they will follow you. So if you're emitting and you know, if you're breathing, um, they typically will chase you down, um, which is pretty, they're a little more of an aggressive tick, I would say, but other ticks, they tend to just kind of sit and wait um, until host brushes by them. Um, so it really depends on the tick species and their behavior. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so potential tick hosts. So ticks are um, relatively generalist. Really depends on their life stage too, like I mentioned. So the white-footed mouse is a very big reservoir host for ticks. Um, they will transmit the pathogen or the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the pathogen of Lyme disease. And so what happens is a tick will bite an infected mouse and then that bacteria then transfers to the tick and then the cycle goes on and, you know, that tick may bite a person. Um, and that's sort of how Lyme disease itself is sort of cycled through the system. Um, other hosts that ticks will feed on or say your dog, um, birds, turkeys, people, um, deer, so really uh, mostly mammals and some birds. Um, there are other cases of other animals as well, but I would say typically most common it's, it's mammals um, and some birds too. So for mosquito potential hosts, it depends on the species. So some species tend to migrate more towards birds, other ones more towards mammals, some even to frogs and worms. Um, you can sort of see in the pictures here, this is a leech, and these are mosquitoes called Urantania saffarina. Um, there's these pretty blue mosquitoes, and they typically will feed on leeches and frogs. Um, some mosquitoes, there's some mosquitoes called the Culex species, and those transmit West Nile virus. They typically will feed on birds. Um, other mosquitoes will feed on mammals. Um, and then any female, mos female mosquitoes, there are some mosquitoes too that will feed on humans. Not all mosquitoes feed on humans, depending on the species. Some really don't care for humans. Um, they might feed on, again, more frogs and worms. Um, others are a little more generalist where they don't really... <laughs> so it really depends on the species of what those mosquitoes prefer to feed on. So range expansion plays a big role in um, mosquitoes and ticks surviving in our climate. So for an example, again, Maine, we have some, uh, we have mosquitoes and ticks that are typically found down south. Um, in Connecticut and Massachusetts that are migrating, migrating their way up to Maine because, again, we're getting warmer winters. They're able to survive for a longer period of time. Um, so we're slowly seeing that migration of these species, these tick and mosquito species that aren't commonly found where we are, but they are probably within the next 10 years or so, they will be sort of established in our state. Um, because of the warmer winters and the host availability and human activity and um, other factors like that. And again, that sort of plays a role in everywhere that um, may have a species that's able to acclimate towards um, that particular area because the conditions were met um, and they're able to survive. So range expansion plays both a role, um, again, in mosquitoes and ticks. Um, and species just migrating to different areas. So a bit of background in terms of some tick-borne disease. So some of examples of the disease that I mentioned earlier. So we have Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, there's hard tick, relapsing fever, Powassan, encephalitis, and alpha-gal syndrome, which you may have heard of. Um, these diseases and pathogens play a different role. Um, with alpha-gal syndrome, especially you may have heard with the lone star tick, um, bitten by a lone star tick, but t depending if you have a reaction or not, you may not be able to consume um, mammalian products, um, particularly like pork and beef. Um, and in terms of how long that lasts, it's not uh, entirely understood yet. It affects some people. Uh, for a certain amount of time and some people still have it today. So it really depends. And not all lone star ticks will give you that allergy. Um, it probably depends on factors like how long the tick's been on you, um, how your body reacts to the, the allergy itself. 
uh, things like that. Um, and yeah, there's, there's definitely more information out there if you're ever curious about more about different pathogens and diseases. Um, in our lab, again, we test for all of these, um, except for alpha gal syndrome because that's an allergy, but we test for um, most from black-legged ticks and dog ticks. And again, black-legged ticks, they would only transmit Lyme disease, anaplasma, speviosis, but we also test for hard tick relapsing fever and Poisson virus in both black-legged and dog tick, but dog ticks transmit other pathogens. Um, they do not transmit Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, or babesiosis. It's only found in black-legged ticks. So, mosquito-borne diseases. So, mosquito-borne diseases, we have diseases like West Nile virus, Eastern equine encephalitis, lacrosse virus, Jamestown Canyon, and then I looked up in Virginia, you have St. Louis encephalitis. Um, for most of these, uh, that mosquito I mentioned earlier, it's called Aculex mosquitoes that typically feeds on birds. They're a big West Nile um, tick, not tick. They're big into uh, transmitting West Nile virus. Um, so, and then with Eastern equine encephalitis, that can really affect horses and it can also um, to really affect humans too. It's a pretty low chance in terms of um, attract uh, contracting the virus itself, but there is a percentage that if you do, um, it'll leave with some uh, pretty severe symptoms. So um, it just depends on uh, losing my train of thought, but anyway, so those are just a couple um, mosquito-borne diseases that um, some mosquitoes can transmit. Okay, so a bit on tick and mosquito prevention. So personal projection, so personal projection works with both mosquitoes and ticks. Um, I would say to avoid tick infested areas such as the wooded edge or wooded areas. Again, it's fine to go hiking, but it's always good to stay sort of on a um, gravel path. Um, so you're not just hiking into the brush itself. And if you are just making sure you do tick checks, but if you just want to leisurely hike somewhere, always kind of staying on that gravel path will help um, prevent interacting with ticks. Um, Areas with a lot of leaf litter, typically ticks will be found in those. So maybe, um, again, if you have to trudge through the leaf litter, just making sure you do a good, good thorough tick check. Um, I've also seen people out in the field, what they do is they put duct tape around their um, pants into their like socks. So that way, if a tick crawls up you, they kind of get stuck to the duct tape. So I've seen that before, which has been really interesting, but I always say tucking in your socks to your pants, um, it helps. So that way the tick doesn't go underneath your pants and up your leg. Um, and it's easier to spot when the tick is on your pants. Um, again, like I said, walking in a clear path and avoiding any um, shrubby vegetation as well um, is a big big area there. Um, continuing on personal pre protection, head nets. So if you're in an area um, like the woods and it's very buggy out, um, head nets are really helpful for mosquito protection and also just helps that that nuisance of mosquitoes just swarming all around you. I find that when I'm out in the field, I do primarily tick research. Um, and so uh, I always wear a head net. So I find that to be pretty helpful. Um, wearing long sleeves, so wearing long sleeve shirts or long pants. And again, if it's a really hot day and you wear short sleeves, that's totally fine. But I would, I always still wear long pants um, when I'm especially like hiking. So that way I could see ticks on me a little bit easier. Also wearing light colored clothes helps because ticks are typically pretty dark. Um, you can see them sort of crawling on you if you're wearing like light beige pants or even a light shirt. Because if you're wearing something like a black shirt and black pants, it's a little bit hard to see ticks on you. What I can also recommend too is taking a lint roller out in the field. So if you're going on a hike, um, you can always lint roll your pants to see if there's any ticks on you. Cause again, ticks are pretty hard to see. So I always find if I have a lint roller, I'll just lint roll my pants after I'm all done hiking and see if any ticks pop up. Um, Cause that can happen too. And again, uh, tucking in your shirt um, and tucking in your pants to your sock also help kind of creating that almost like a coverall, um, so that way ticks can't easily 
um, slip under your pants or anything like that and, and, and bite your leg. Um, and like I just mentioned, the, the mosquito head net is also very helpful. Um, performing tick checks. So performing tick checks on yourselves, on your kids, on your pets, um, returning when you're returning from a hike. So always very important to, to do tick checks. Um, and then to uh, shower and remove any clothing that you had from a hike, you can put them, you can either wash them or if you don't want to, you can put them immediately in the dryer and that heat itself will, will kill the tick. Um, cause sometimes too, what happens is we might take the clothes and a tick could still be on it. So it's always good to either put the clothes in like a little baggie, um, and tying that before you wash it or washing it right away. I find when I'm on the field pretty frequently, I'll either do a lot of laundry or I'll just sort of tie all my clothes in a bag, um, and wait to do laundry then, um, because I don't want ticks crawling all over the house or anything. So I try to contain whatever clothes I had, especially if it's a very ticky area. Um, I try to be a little more careful on that. Um, yep, place clothes and dryer. So in terms of where ticks are typically found, um, it depends. So um, here I have a diagram of where ticks are found on a person. So you can see, and it really depends on adults and children. So you could see pretty clearly on this graph that with adults, the highest amount where ticks are found is on your leg. And with children, it's on their head. Um, it could be based on height. So obviously adults were a lot taller than children. Um, so the tick will kind of go to the highest point it can. Um, and in that case with children, it's typically their head or behind their ears. Um, ticks also like little crevices, so you can check behind like your leg, um, right behind your knee. So in that little crevice there, ticks will typically kind of bury themselves in there. Um, under the armpits, there's a spot, um, your torso. Um, so it, it really depends, yeah, um, where those ticks can be. Um, in terms of uh, repellents, so these repellents work for both mosquitoes and ticks. So you can use things like DEET um, to treat your clothes before going out in the woods. Um, I typically will use DEET pretty often. Permethrin, so that's something that you can use um, to treat your clothes beforehand. So you would spray your clothes with permethrin and that will actually last quite a while. Um, and you can use your permethrin treated clothes to help um, deter ticks and mosquitoes. There's also an IR3535. Um, that's another way to treat. And then there's also oil of the euca lemon eucalyptus. Um, is That scent's very strong for them, so they typically don't like it. So that's something a little more on the natural side um, that you can use to um, prevent ticks and mosquitoes as well. So last thing, tick and mosquito management. So for tick and mosquito management, we participate in active surveillance. So what that means is we perform a tick drag and you can see up in this corner here, what we do is we have a one meter by one meter uh, cloth, um, typically like a corduroy material. And so what we do is we drag that cloth behind us. And so any questing ticks will attach themselves to the cloth. And that way we'll know how many ticks are in that area at a given time. Um, we then count the ticks, we'll see um, what life stage they're at, but that's one way you can even do something like that around your own home. If you find that you're get collecting a lot of ticks off your animals, you can always perform a tick drag and see what ticks you find. Um, and that way it can kind of give you an idea of if you have a plethora of ticks on your property or if you only have a couple, um, that's one way, one way you can do it. You can also monitor um, different hosts. So like I mentioned earlier, how ticks will feed on deer. They'll also feed on um, small rodents. So if you're feeding deer in your backyard, that's potential of ticks also coming into your backyard. So um, making sure that other animals, um, if you leave things out uh, for them and they're sort of um, congregating in your backyard, so maybe, um, by reducing that, you'll have a little less deer. 
Um, so managing the animals that you do have on the property themselves. And again, we'll kind of go over that a little bit more too um, later in this uh, presentation. We're going to talk about how you can manage different hosts as well. Um, with our passive surveillance data, what we had was majority of people picked up ticks in during yard work and gardening. Um, so when you're outside for an extended period of time and you're gardening or doing yard work, um, that's a, another hot spot to find ticks. Um, typically, all the ticks we get into our um, system is from that. Also, just playing outside, walking, hiking. Um, anything that evolves really in the woods, um, you'll encounter a tick a little bit more. Um, sometimes pets will bring it in, um, hunting, trapping, camping, playing sports. Um, and the lowest we see is bicycling, bicycling, fishing, and running. So you get a couple ticks in, but not very many. So the most of the ticks we get in are from yard work, gardening, and playing outside, and walking and hiking. So um, quite a bit with that. And also, too, with this, you can see uh, based on residents, so on your own residence, um, people will tend to pick off ticks more on themselves at their own property or private property. So let's say like um, uh, someone else's property or a park, public lands, and then other is sort of a mix of, every, of um, some other categories. So a bit on mosquito management and surveillance. So what we do with some mosquito management is we set out traps um, in order to determine what mosquitoes are in that area. So we set out two different types of traps. We set out a gravid trap, which is right here with the bucket and a light trap. Um, both traps sort of uh, attract different types of mosquitoes. So the gravid trap here will typically attract mosquitoes that are looking to lay their eggs. Um, we call them gravid females. And what that gives us is um, mosquitoes that um, typically like open water containers, like I mentioned earlier, that Q-like species typically will be found in this gravid trap here. Um, the light trap, they're attracted to a light. Also, some light traps have a CO2 component, so they have dry ice in a cooler that also attracts the mosquitoes. Um, the light traps are a little bit more for the diversity, so we tend to see more species of mosquito and light traps compared to gravid traps, but those are two ways that um, we collect mosquitoes um, at the University of Maine Property Extension. So those are ways that we monitor for mosquitoes. <clears throat> so going back now to tick management landscape modifications so keeping the lawn mowed and rakes uh, leaves raked um, is one way to sort of reduce some ticks on the property so keeping the grass a bit shorter um, especially in areas where you're typically active or your pets or your children are very active it's nice to kind of keep as a little subdued area of where um, it's mowed a little bit shorter um, making sure to clear leaf litter, tall grasses, and brush from around the home. Um, again, it's fine to have it a little bit on the outskirts, but if you're in an area where you're actively, um, where you actively are, it's, it's good to kind of keep it a little more trimmed in that regard. Removing trash, br brush piles, and automobiles, things like that. So any sort of, um, trash piling up in the yard that can also help prevent um, ticks, and then trim, pruning, and removing trees to let more sunlight in. Typically, ticks like areas that are a little bit more on the shaded side, um, so having areas that are a little more sunlit may also reduce some ticks. <clears throat> uh, placing bird feeders around, um, away from the home. Um, will also help. So if you have, if you're attracting air animals too close to home, um, that might also attract more ticks. Um, so if you still want bird feeders, it's always good or better to place them a little bit further away from the home. And placing decks, patios, playgrounds in full sun. Again, um, full sunlight gets very hot, especially in the summer. So it sort of deters some ticks compared to nice cooler shaded areas. Um, and then to deter um, 
Six again, you can install a three foot wide barrier of wood chips gravel between the lawn and the wooded edge. So sort of like down here, um, it makes it so that way there's not long grasses sort of peering over your property. Um, so it kind of gives a little bit of a barrier of that outer edge. Because again, ticks, uh, especially the black legged tick and the dog tick, they don't move very much. They sort of just quest in one spot. But if there's a lot of open grass or a lot of tall grasses available to them, they typically will move around a little bit more. But if there's that barrier of wood chips, they they won't really, they will sometimes, but there's less ticks that would actually approach your property um, compared to areas that has a lot of grass, a lot of long grasses. So in terms of mosquito management, um, what you can do is if you have an area where you have a lot of trees, you can fill tree holes to prevent them from filling with water. Because again, like I mentioned earlier, there are some mosquito species that really like tree holes. So preventing those pools of water really help. Um, using screen and windows and doors. So instead of just leaving a door open without a screen, having that screen there kind of creates a barrier so that way mosquitoes um, can't openly fly into your home. Emptying containers of stagnant water. So if you have any water in the backyard of pails or buckets or toys that get filled up with water, it's always good to sort of dump that water so that way you're preventing more mosquitoes on your property itself. Um, such as emptying and turning over containers, buckets, planters, toys, pools, bird baths, trash containers, etc. Um, kind of keeping it so there's no way uh, water can pool in those sort of buckets and containers. So now we're moving on to tick pants to side management. Um, what you can do is there are a care side, so that's specific for ticks. Um, and a caricide should be focused primarily on tick habitat around the home, so typically boring wooded edges. Um, this is best suited for the nymphal black-legged ticks, so those are the smaller ticks. Um, and many of these products are um, administered by a licensed applicator. So a lot of the times you would call um, a tick pest management. Um, and they would come out and, and spray your property for you. And that's one way to sort of prevent some ticks on your property. Mm -hmm. um, some other types of tick pesticides. Um, this is more focused on the host themselves. So on those rodents and deer. Um, there are rodent bait boxes. These uh, treat rodents with the caricides. Um, again, this doesn't kill the mice, but what it does, it's sort of like a flea and tick for your dog or cat, except it's flea and tick for your not your mice, <laughs> the mice in your yard. Um, so that way it sort of prevents ticks from attaching themselves to the mouse, or if they do, they die, um, similar to flea and tick on dogs and cats. So this is something for, for rodents. There's also permethrin treated cotton balls. So this treats rodents with per permethrin on their body. So again, this doesn't kill the mouse. Um, instead, mice will use the cotton ball as nesting material. And by taking the cotton ball, um, they're sort of rubbing it on their fur. And so that also treats themselves from ticks, um, which has been, which is really interesting. There's also deer feeding stations, which I had to look this one up because I thought it was really interesting. Um, you can see here in this picture is what happens is it's, oh, I meant to say deer. It treats the deer with permethrin. Um, on their bodies similar to the mice. And so um, there's these little rollers here and what happens is the deer will be feeding in this little trough and the rollers will actually rub up against the deer himself, but typically it looks like behind the ears and it treats the deer with permethrin too. And so that will also deter ticks um, from either biting the deer or if they bite the deer, the deer would, the ticks would die. Um, and this is something that would be a special permit from the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, so this is something that isn't really commercially used, but it's something that could happen if it's in an area that's like really ticky. Um, so now we're on to mosquito pesticides. So you can use larvicides, um, which are a type of insecticide to control mosquitoes around the home. Um, larvicides, again, kill the larvae of the mosquitoes, so this might be something that you would treat water. Um, 
And what would happen was the mosquito might lay their eggs in that pool of water and then the larvae would just never hatch or they would die immediately after. Um, and this basically just kills the mosquito larvae before they can pupate into adults. Um, and the larvicides do not harm people, pets, or the environment themselves. So want to disclaimer that right there. So even though you're putting this larvicide in water, um, it's not going to harm anyone else in your home other than the larvae mosquitoes. So yeah, so that's that's my talk. Um, I hope you learned a lot about the biology, ecology, management, and prevention of ticks and mosquitoes. It was kind of a lot. Um, I appreciate you guys, everybody sticking around. Um, I'm happy to take more questions. Most of the what I have from my PowerPoint is from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, uh, which is a great resource on tick management. Um, we don't have a lot of mosquito management right now, but I'm sure that time will change as we're doing more mosquito work. Um, but we have done tick work since 2018, and so we have a, a great um, database of all the tick research we've done and also some great strategies on how to prevent ticks in your home. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. And then Alicia also has a survey. So um, at this little QR code, so you're welcome to take the survey at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Alyssa. <clears throat> I did see some questions pop up in the chat. So one oh, question sure. from Catherine is, is there an animal that eats ticks? Is there an animal that eats ticks? There are some. I wouldn't say there's a particular animal that would eat, that would really reduce a lot of ticks on the property. Um, there are animals like possums will eat ticks. Some chickens or birds might peck at ticks, but it's not really enough to um, physically reduce all the ticks on your property. Um, but there are some animals out there that will eat ticks. Um, from what I know, possums, they, they do like ticks, but they'll also eat other things too. So Cassie has asked a question about mosquitoes in a large, sometimes swampy wetland area, specifically in the county we live in, which is Prince William County in a mm -hmm. community uh, homeowners association. Um, I think I can answer this question just because I used to work with Prince William County Mosquito Control. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, they don't resort to spraying immediately. They have to have certain thresholds of West Nile positive tested mosquitoes. Um, so unfortunately, they can't come out and spray. And we also like to tell people that be aware of what is being sprayed <clears throat> because sometimes these sprays, even though they do claim to be natural, um, they are sometimes much higher concentrations of a naturally derived chemical um, that can actually affect pollinators and other um, non-target species. So that's something to just be a, a little aware of when you are exploring pest control for your homes and communities. <clears throat> Uh, I have also asked if permethrin is strictly used on clothing only or can it be used as a replacement for DEET? I've only ever used it for clothing. Um, I don't think it's the best for your skin um, from what I've read about permethrin. Um, so I, that's something I don't, not entirely sure, but from what I know that permethrin is typically only treated on clothing. Now, if you got a little bit on your skin, it's probably okay, but I wouldn't like spray your skin with permethrin um, compared to some of the other products out there that say it's safe for, for your skin. Yeah, that's a good question though. Thank you. Alyssa, I've got a question. Yeah. Sure. Um, my, I've got a bunch of little kids. Um, I've got four young kids and they're mm -hmm. outside playing every day when it's nice out. Mm -hmm. And um, they like to play right where the lawn and the, the woods meet. And yeah. so I was wondering if um, we do tick, tick checks every day when they're playing outside, but I've read up on a lot of ticks that some pathogens can be transferred in just a few hours of attachment. So I'm wondering if it's better to just do what we're doing and do a tick, tick check every night, or if it's better to do a preventative spray every day before they go out to play, which really would be almost every day. Um, yeah, that's a really great question, honestly. Um, I would say still continue to do the tick checks for sure. You can also, um, like I mentioned earlier, lint rollers really help with that too. If it's on their clothes, you can kind of like lint roll their clothes if they're going right inside after. Um, you can check with, or, um, there is, 
probably more of like a kid friendly deet. Um, if you did something, want to like spray their shoes or like spray their pants even, um, just to sort of prevent some ticks from crawling up. Um, but I'm not entirely sure in terms of like the best, um, uh, protection in terms of for children. Um, but yeah, I would say to continue with tick checks and then um, see what's on the market in terms of like more um, children kid friendly. If there's like a, a DEET like spray or if there is a spray that's a little bit less concentrated or something like that. Um, and again, you could, you know, there's permethrin too in terms of like treating their clothes. Um, you can see if something like that would help. Yeah. Um, and I do have that and I've used it. And that actually leads me to my next question. I've yeah. actually done the tick tubes where, you know, I treat cotton balls and put them out for mice to use. So I've done that. Is there a specific time where it's better to put out like where, um, is it early spring or early fall? Like what's the best time if you're going to put those out around your property to get the most, um, I guess, out of, you know, placing that permethrin um, sprayed cotton? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would probably do during times that ticks are most active. Um, so we typically will see now um, late fall is when we start seeing more adult ticks. But if you're aiming for more of the nymphal ticks, I want to say it's um, early spring. Um, so typically to um, early summer. Um, we'll see more of those nymphal ticks. So I would say starting by like springtime when we start seeing the ticks, um, that might be the best time to start treating those little cotton balls. So that way, um, that's when the, those nymphal ticks are most active. Um, cause it's those two life cycles, it's early spring into summer, and then we'll start seeing them again. Um, it's fall around this time um, because during the summer itself, it's a lot of larvae. And so with larvae, from what we know, they don't um, transmit any pathogens to people. Um, they do obviously bite mites and things like that. So honestly, I would probably start from spring all the way until fall. If you want to start just like putting those little cotton balls out, that's like kind of the active period of when ticks are. Out. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Sure. There is another question. Um, there are posts on Instagram that state that mosquitoes are selective and are drawn to specific body odors or pH levels on humans. Um, that's a pretty interesting one because I know I always used to get bit going outside, and yet my other friends are, are also outside and they never get bit. So you want to comment on that? Sure. I've read a paper before about how some mosquitoes are attracted to different blood types. Um, I'm not too familiar with it, but I... it. it it doesn't surprise me that mosquitoes do have this like sense of um, different body odors and things like that. So I would say if people are sweating a lot more, um, so say if you're going on a hiking with a friend that's a little more sweaty than you, the mosquitoes will probably more be attracted to someone that's um, uh, excreting more sweat compared to someone that's not. Um, so yeah, that is, that is a really interesting question. And I think it, it, it does play a role in um, in those factors. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see any other questions. So just before we leave, um, I just want to point out that I dropped a link in the chat um, for the Virginia Department of Health tick survey. So if you go to that link, if you find a tick on yourself, you are more than welcome to take a photo or actually send in the tick. So that way they can contribute some more data to their citizen science uh, information. So that way they can track the Virginia um, tick populations in our area, um, because that is a big public concern. So the Virginia Department of Health will be tracking that. <clears throat> And um, also the survey that Alyssa had mentioned, if you don't mind just uh, filling that out, that would be much appreciated. Um, it helps out our um, extension. And um, Alyssa, thank you so much for uh, presenting tonight on mosquitoes and ticks. I'm sure everyone here has learned a lot about mosquitoes and ticks, um, and they are pretty gross in my opinion, but you know, to each their own. So um, thank you again for volunteering your time to do this. <clears throat> yeah, of course.